Hey guys, Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hey guys, welcome to another video of the Sister Vlogs. Today, Adi and I were doing our Ramadan challenge and the challenge was find someone that inspires you. So we were searching and searching and searching and then we finally found one person that connected us to, to us especially happy so happy who's the person so the person lives in the uk uh he uh he's a award he's an award-winning entrepreneur and he's also a motivational speaker uh he uh he wrote his first book when he was 16 called the world at your feet and he has three four other books um he create uh, he created a board game which is used in the uk system and he was diagnosed with epilepsy um and people told him that he couldn't do anything but he still did it and he was fired and fi hired and fired by his cousin when he was 13. <laughs> yeah so everyone please welcome sabirul islam Waalaikum salam. hi there i can see you i can hear you hello how are you how are you i'm very well indeed thank you for asking um yeah i'm no, sorry for the the technical issues oh but. it's okay thank you for so much for understanding no, it's fine. It's fine. First and foremost, thank you for the invitation. When I went onto your uh, YouTube channel, I was like amazed, like, wow. Um, mm -hmm. So proud of you both uh, for what you're doing. And uh, I, I think it really does set a great example to all the young people out there. Um, oh, that, thank you. That age is just a number. And if you have the passion, the will and the desire, you can really achieve anything. So well so done to you. Both. So inspirational. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, uh, our mom gave us a challenge to um, talk to someone who inspires us and you know you inspired us so that's why we sent you with an interview request and thank you so much Jessica Lohair for accepting. Oh my pleasure. So, um, yeah so hopefully you enjoy our conversation and you don't mind us asking the questions. Now this interview is for you so you do have the option to whether to um, uh, wh whether to uh, answer it or you could you don't have to. So, no, sure, that's fine. You can throw me as many questions, no matter how difficult, challenging it is. I will try and give it my best shot. Uh, thank okay. You. Okay. So, for viewers that are watching, um, they they probably might not know what we're talking about. So, could you please summarize your story and your experience for them? Okay. Yeah. So, my name is uh, Sabiru Sabiru Islam, and uh, most of the world knows me as an entrepreneur, a, a writer, author, and. Um, most importantly, a motivational speaker. So I've gone around the world uh, empowering a lot of people. In fact, I did a, a tour around the world to inspire a million people um, between 2010 to 2014 in 31 different countries. Uh, I got started in business when I was uh, 14. So I was slightly older than you and because you guys are like 13 and five years old. So uh, yeah, so you beat me to it. Uh, at that front, but uh, I think it, it's been a, a great journey to, especially to write uh, three or four books, uh, which went on to become bestsellers, empowering young people like yourself that no matter what age, race, religion, culture, you can all be successful in life as long as you have the will, the power, and the the belief uh, in yourself that you can be more than what initially society perceived you to be. Wow, you can inspire a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I do. It, yeah. So the first thing I would like to know is why and what made you want to work at such an, such an early age? Because at my age, you know, um, you were 13 when you started, you know, working. I'm 13. And usually at this time, I'd be playing and, you know, doing fun stuff and hanging out with my sister. Nah. So that would sure. be a lot of responsibilities, but, you know, that would be a lot of responsibilities. Yeah, well, the thing is, 13 was a nice age because... The whole idea is that I was in school that time. You're, you're doing everything you would do in school. You're doing your English, math, science, uh, trying to put your, your head down and do as much and focus as much as you can on your studies. But what empowered me was my cousin. You know, he's the one who really took the plunge. He's the one who I really looked up to and said, he's actually setting and running his own business with his friends. The idea perhaps wasn't the greatest. It was designing calendars, 12 month calendars for teachers in school. So, uh, it was just taking that initiative to go up to him and say, cousin, can I work for you? And it was what, what hit me at that time was more the fact that I want to learn what I can do. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And that sort of initial 
sort of belief and character that you that somebody needs to actually explore and willing to explore helps them understand what are the rights and wrongs in life. And to be fair, I was only working for my cousin for a period of two weeks. I got fired. I was being lazy. I was didn't know what uh, what the expectations were on my shoulders. Um, but that was a big learning curve. And I think that for young people like yourself, you have to position your mindset in a way where you have to give something a try learn to explore, understand what the initial boundary is in your own life, and then see how you can really stretch that, how you can make your own self grow. And the whole idea about belief and capturing belief is through building confidence, is through having courage, is having determination and the drive to try something. And then if you fail at it, just like I did, I failed and got fired at the age of 13. It woke me up. It woke me up to the point where I wanted to not just prove my cousin wrong, that how could he fire somebody so talented because I believed that I was so talented I was so I had so much uh, authority and power in me that I could use that to to good uh, and I and to be fair I wanted to prove him wrong so I went on to then set up my own business to get my own back on my cousin um, but then that was like a whole new exploration so I was 14 when I set up my first business with my friends in school and that was a great experience wow so your cousin is where you got most of your motivation from yeah, and, and and the thing is, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have known. I would have not known what what to explore and how to have perceived uh, these sort of different things. For example, like think simple things like how we're communicating right now. Yeah. For me, it'd always be with my friends talking in, in in very much normal language. But when you're in a very professional setting, you're putting on your suit, uh, you got your ties done up, uh, and you're having to behave in a way that's out of character, different. And you're getting to learn about yourself in in very much di differently each and every day so that was a very unique experience when I got to see people and meet people who were a lot older than I was um, who are already in their professional career and the way they're presenting themselves they set a standard and I was looking up to them thinking oh wow I, I really like what they're doing how can I be like them so I wasn't looking up to celebrities I wasn't looking up to big name stars that a lot of young people tend to do I was looking up to people who who are within reach who I know that maybe one or two steps I can reach to that level and that gave me a goal it gave me an objective to follow and when you have that in mind then you set yourself daily tasks daily object objectives what do you need to do to get yourself to that position so then you have that sort of you build up a certain momentum habit uh, over time and I think that's what a lot of young people need and I think you can often get very much distracted but I say if you do what you love if you do something you're passionate about then everything else falls into place because you always be happy you'll always be energized you'll always be passionate about what you do and that's the spirit uh, that I had uh, throughout my, my teenage life wow yeah okay so um, I want to know what were you doing at the age of 13 like what was your routine because I want to compare what you were doing at 13 and what I'm doing at 13. Uh -huh. Okay, well, I can, if we got to directly compare, I can say you're doing a hell of a lot more than what I did when I was 13. Uh, okay. Because I was, I was very shy. I was this shy character who actually was afraid because I see myself as an introvert. So somebody who's almost likes to put themselves away, away from the environment, the noise. Uh, I always used to stay in solitude, hide, my, hide myself away and just used to think what can I do and how can I do it? Um, and that approach just to even go up to my cousin and say, can I work for you? Took a lot of guts, took a lot of effort and took a lot of, it was almost a big risk for me because I was afraid that we're, I'm going to hamper my relationship with my cousin who I love so much. Um, and to the point where he was making bold decision, big decisions uh, to, to say that, no, Sabirul, you're not doing well enough in the company. I have, I had high expectations for you, but you didn't live up to the expectations. So I'm going to have to let you go. So I got fired. And then what happened after that, when I set up my own business, um, I employed six of my friends. And uh, to be fair, if you are, were to ask me, what did I actually do in the business? I was the managing director. I was the one who formed the company. But if the idea of it, of the business was actually designing websites and ask me today that Sabirul, do you know how to design a website? I will tell you no. I ran a business for two years from my age of 14 to 16 and I did not know how to run the, the, the I didn't know how to design the uh, business, uh, websites. And that's exactly what the business was all about because I knew my friends were all tech geniuses. I knew that they had the skills, they had the caliber. I knew how to guide them 
I knew how to show them the way. So when I bring these talent together, let's let's work together to see what we can do to solve a, a common goal. And that time in my local community, a lot of new businesses were setting up, a lot of new businesses required uh, website design. So we saw a gap in the market and we tried to make the most of that through the skills and qualities my friend had. And so it was a great way to, and my message actually here is that if you look at our friends around you, however old they are, if you're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, what are you good at and what are they good at? And what can you do to combine those uh, skills together to make sure that you can actually leverage and do something so much more than just playing computer games and uh, and doing your homework and so on and so forth? Because every day of your life, you're, you're, you're going on, on a journey. Every day is a new challenge, a fresh challenge. And what you don't want to do is go to school, come back from school, do your homework, and then you're left with a couple of hours not knowing what to do. Have an objective. Have something that you can fill that time with that's productive that's going to add value to you because the whole thing is about expectation you know a young person is not expected to do anything other than study anything other than go to school do their exams come out of school and then go into to college and and and, and, and do great things from there on so when you do something on a, at a young age people look at you differently <gasps> like wow, you are somebody, you know, they want to be a part of you. They almost tag along, they grip along to you and, and they really open your eyes they, and you open their eyes. So people want to be as much supportive as possible to people like you, um, you know, running your own YouTube channel, having many thousands of subscribers at such a young age. Like this is, this is in today's society, this is a crazy talk. Like how and how did you do that? So for me, naturally to be, attached to what you do it's only normal because the whole idea is that you are somebody young doing something beyond what a young person is meant to do so that's why like when you came up across and say you want to interview me usually i would turn interviews down uh, unless they had a specific purpose but the thing is you're young you're creative you took a risk you took an opportunity and i said this is exactly the sort of individuals that actually echo the values that and beliefs that i have and you are the symbol of what young people should be all about taking risks taking an opportunity because you just don't know what comes out on the other side oh thank you yeah that was that was really inspirational no, yeah, absolute how pleasure did you, how did you manage to go to school and do all that stuff <sighs> Well, that's, that's probably the most toughest question somebody's asked me. Um, so how did I manage to do all of this? I had to manage my time. So time management is something so important that uh, when I go to school, I'm in school between nine and, and three o'clock, half, half three. I come back home, have a snack, uh, and immediately I'm on my homework, doing my homework and I finish around five o'clock. Uh, and dinner is not, or supper is not until around, uh, around 7.30, 8 o'clock. So that time that I had, what could I do? What could I do to best leverage that time? And even during school, the, the day in school, my breaks. Yes, on some days I would actually spend time playing with my friends. And on other days where the lunch break is about 45 minutes to an hour long, I would bring them together. Let's look at opportunities. Who could be our next client? And let's, let's con contact them. Let's give them a phone call. I even used to speak to my teachers and tell them, can I go outside of school for that half an hour, 45 minutes, just to go and speak to local businesses who need a website designed? Um, so it's just taking a big risk. And you know, my first clients actually was, was not a teacher. It was actually um, a big investment banking company, um, Merrill Lynch. Um, so Merrill Lynch were my first clients. So how did I get um, this? How did I land this uh, big deal? The thing is, I was wearing my school uniform. I went into the into Merrill Lynch, just going through their doors, passing through their security with no ID whatsoever, and just saying to random people walking by in Merrill Lynch, can I design you a website? I'm Sabir Al Islam. I'm running a company. My company was called Veyron Technology at the time. Uh, and uh, I'd like to design your website. A lot of people would just walk by and saying, who are you? Why are you here? Um, and the security guard actually held me like this and wanted to do, throw me out. Um, but one of the things is that when having walked through Merrill Lynch, they, there was one of their directors who looked at me and said, uh, you're, you're, you're 13, 14 years old, you just, and you're trying to sell me something. Um, and so he gave us his time. So me and my friend went that time. And uh, yeah, so he gave us 15 minutes of his time and we just sat down uh, with him explaining who we are. We're a web designing company. We're young, we're creative, we're buzzing with energy and we'd love to design Merrill Lynch a website or you a website. And uh, there and then we actually even had a contract where and say, here you go, there, sign. And we made a lot of money just from that day alone. So the point is, 
we just had to be creative. We just had to utilize the time, whatever we had during breaks, whatever we had during lunchtime, uh, whatever we had after school, just to make sure that we can get the business to keep running. And if you were to ask me, would I run a web design business for the rest of my life? No, because that's not my passion. My passion, I had to discover because what my business did was enable me an opportunity to open doors. It opened doors to build that relationship with Merrill Lynch, who then took me to New York two years later uh, to learn about the stock market. So I learned stock trading. Uh, it was a great opportunity there. I came back when I turned 17. All that experience of running a business, being with my friends, everything I learned, there was a lot of young people like yourself asking me, Sabirul, how did you do this and how can we do the same? And that's what led to me writing my first book uh, called The World at Your Feet at the age of 17. Wow. So your friends got inspired by you too. Yeah. Friends, community, uh, because it's all, to them, it was so abnormal, so different. Uh, because young people, when you do something different and your community does not expect it, especially when you're raised in a very cultural sort of, um, in, a, in a cultural dome, in a cultural sort of barrier, uh, and the only expectation is go to school, college, university, get your degree, and after that, look for a job, you get your job, you do successful in your job, you get married, you have your own kids, and then they go through that exact same process. So it's that. So it's like a continuous loop you know, society is going through. So how do we break that? How do we do more than what society is expecting from young people. Uh, so it was that that really woke me up. And I want to share with this with you. And I think it's important that I, every, every, no matter how old or how young you are, that there's a question that I would want everybody who is listening to even ask themselves, even if you're 12, 13, 14, however old you are. When you leave this world, what will you be remembered for? Now, it's a very philosophical question that it takes you on a journey. It opens your eyes to think that I want to be a somebody. This somebody doesn't have to be big. This somebody doesn't have to be a multimillionaire or multi-billionaire because success is defined differently for different people. You know, for somebody, success could mean just making their family happy. So for somebody else, success could mean, you know, having a, a nice fancy car. Somebody else, success could mean whatever. It's just having a definition of what success means for you and what intrinsically, internally makes you feel proud of who you are. That yes, I've lived life, I've done something in life and I'm happy for what I've done. Uh, and you self-appreciate for who you are and what you do. Um, that's why I always look, and I'm now looking at you both and I'm thinking, Mashallah, you, you, you've done something absolutely amazing. You've reached out to somebody who you, you say you've been following some of my, my talks online. You've done your research. You've done your background. So you've taken a lot of energy, effort, and time, which a lot of young people wouldn't often do. Um, so it goes to show that you are already one step ahead of the ordinary. You are already on that level to becoming extraordinary. It's just the difficulty is maintaining that year in, year out, to maintain that and having that courage to say that, What's next for me? I've done this. I've got now 3,000 or so subscribers. What's next? You need your next 7,000 subscribers. If you're watching and if you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe to this channel. The channel is awesome. Um, so it's about giving, it's about knowing where you, what your next move is. And I say, career doesn't have to be just one, one direction. You, have, you can have multi dimensions to what you do. You can do more than one thing. You don't just have to be, grow up to become a lawyer, a doctor, a solicitor, a barrister, or whatever. You know, you can be many things. I started off as an entrepreneur. I got into investment. Was entrepreneurship my thing? Maybe not. Was investment my thing? Maybe not. But I got into writing and I loved it. I felt passionate about writing. But where my true discovery came about was when I started speaking on stage and delivering tours around the world, uh, inspiring young people like yourself that no matter the age, race, religion, race, or culture, you can all be extraordinary. And that was a big breakthrough uh, for me. And speaking on stage for me is, my, is where my heart lies. And I think I, I would do that no matter any time of the day, no matter how many times somebody asked me, Sabur, can you come and speak at an event? I would you know, jump onto that opportunity because it's, it's what I love doing. It's what makes me happy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was, I mean, everything you're saying, your answers are just so inspirational. Like that <laughs> even like makes me inspired too. Well, it's, 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 I'm happy. I'm happy that uh, you feel that way. And uh, it's, it's about making sure that you're able to take those words on board and you're able to spread them amongst your family, amongst your friends. Um, even just one little thing you take away from here, at least I've done my part, 
it's about you then carrying that flag and, and saying that, yes, here, I'm going to pass it on to somebody else um, and making sure that that continues to, to go because you are an inspiration yourself uh, for what you do. And it's just making sure you have a story to tell with that as well. And I think that's really important. Oh, that, that means so much coming from you. You have created a board game. What is it mostly about? Like what teaches your board game kids? Okay, so the board game, oh my God, the board game was quite an interesting journey. So the board game is actually a business board game. It teaches about uh, money. So how to learn to invest money, how to spend money wisely. You run your own business. So let's say there's six players in the game. They would all each run, each will run their own different business. One would be a market stall, one will be a local shop, all the way up to somebody running a hotel. So nobody runs the same business. Um, and they're all given different amounts in money. So the market stall guy is given only $250 uh, and the hotel guy has $1,500 dollars to run his business so that would, what that represents is not everybody is on the same level and that's how society is that's how life is so with what you have how much profit can you make so how it's all about the decision making making sure that you invest your money wisely so that if you have 250 dollars in your hand how can you end up with 500 dollars so you have 250 dollars profit so you have to make smart decisions to make sure that you employ the right number of people you're paying their salaries and they're getting their job done you're marketing and advertising the business correctly so that you're attracting customers and you have keep tabs on how many customers you have so you play the game to become the person who makes the most profit by the end of a specific time frame. Usually the game lasts around two hours, one and a half to two hours. Um, and uh, it's really cool just to learn exactly about how to manage your bank balance. It's about income and expenditure. So it's everything to do with business and it's everything to do entrepreneurship and also to do with how to invest and how to learn how to manage money. So that's the idea behind the board game. And, you know, I learned about money management. Let me tell you a quick story. My dad gave me 50, in, 50 pounds, which is like equivalent to around, I think around 70, $80 um, when I was about eight years old. He told me to guard it with my life, not to even show my mother. And it was a really brand new uh, note that he gave me. And I kept it in my pocket and I, he told me, hide it and don't, let, don't ever show your mother. That's my gift to you. And I was so excited. I've never seen such a big note. I was eight years old and I was so excited. Um, and I hid it under the carpet. But the thing is, uh, 30 minutes later, an hour later, it was just something going in my stomach. No, I need to tell somebody that my dad's given me so much money and, uh, and at this young age. And so what happened, I couldn't hold it. I couldn't contain myself. So I go downstairs and I take, I take, the, take it out from outside the carpet and I go and quickly show my mom, dad gave me this much money. And who walks by? My dad walks by. And his eyes were so scary at that time. Oh my God, he was, uh, I felt so guilty. And what he did was he, he said that you betrayed trust, that we had this bond, we had this trust, and you couldn't live up to, to keeping a secrecy and, and, and a promise. Because uh, you promised me you would guard it and you wouldn't show anybody. So that was a big learning curve for me about money. Ever since then, he's not given me any spending money or anything like that. I had to earn it. Um, so what I had to do was learn to save money, learn to value money. That no matter how much, how big or small the amount is, if you if you if you're given five dollars to for your uh, school um, for your for your lunch money, for example, I used to probably spend around two dollars and, and keep the rest three. Learn to save each and every day until I had enough money on my hand uh, at the age of 11, 12 to, to do better things with that money. So it's, it's about knowing exactly why money is important. When you have that attitude that saving is more important than spending, and especially when spending on things that are irrelevant, uh, you become more mature. And maturity brings a lot of respect and a lot of credibility in whatever whatever it is you do. So that's what I wanted to teach through the board game. And that's a story that relates with the board game as to why I ended up creating the game uh, and how it's impacted so many people uh, in around 14 countries around the world. Wow. So when you, um, when, uh, when you showed your mom uh, the money that your dad gave you, what did she say? She was a first shocked because he doesn't, <laughs> he wouldn't often give her that, that uh, large amount um, that he gave me. So there was a lot of trust and bond, which my, which my dad had with me, or he, th he thought he had with me. And I broke that. And my mom was sad and upset to the point where, because I showed her, um, because I kind of broke that um, trust. So 
but the thing is what i loved about my mom is that she she's the one who then you know used to give me five dollars six dollars here and there uh whatever loose change she had just to learn to to build up that trust and build up that element of saving and it was that that helped me bring so much knowledge and so much importance to my life in terms of how to spend and how to utilize and how to value money um, that we shouldn't be splashing money or spending money on things that we don't need and that's why it was so much more easier for me to go into business at a lot younger age because I learned those important life lessons about money from a very young age all through a mistake that I made. So again, it's a message that you won't necessarily learn things in life unless you give something a try and then you make a mistake from it and then you're able to learn from that mistake on how to better improve yourself. Because as I say, you don't know what part of you comes out on the other side or what you what you knew you comes out on the other side. So it's important you learn that way. If something does seem scary, uh, it's only scary because your mind is telling you it's scary. Once you actually give something a try and you see exactly, perhaps maybe it's not as scary as you initially thought. Um, so once you give it a try and you experience it, you might actually learn something more about yourself that you actually have more skills, more strengths, more qualities that you didn't initially think were there or were not possible, especially for somebody uh, like myself or like you, because only then do you actually get to learn who you are and what you're true, you know, what you're truly capable of. Yeah. Um, so I do know that you were diagnosed with epilepsy. You were told that you were diagnosed with epilepsy. I want to kind of relate to that. When I was in third grade, I was performing really bad in school. I was getting like low grades and, you know, I, I wasn't, get, I wasn't, you know, performing well. And then, in, uh, then I was diagnosed with ADHD. I was told that, and um, even before I was diagnosed and I was like thinking, I can't do anything. I used to give up so easily. So, and even after I was diagnosed, I was, I still kept thinking to myself, like, this is much worse. I, st I, I still mm. felt like I couldn't do anything. Um, so then uh, I took a therapy courses for one to two years and well, it was boring just sitting there in the room, but you know, it, it actually helped me improve. You know, I started getting higher grades and, you know, um, I also took medication too for a while, mm -hmm. and that did actually help my mindset a little bit more. That helped me focus more, not getting distracted. Um, so, so I do kind of feel when people were mm -hmm. saying that you couldn't do anything, but it, the difference is that I was telling myself that I couldn't do anything. But mm -hmm. my parents were really supportive. They were like, "You can do it." You know, they were telling me people with like there's so many people and famous people around the world with ADHD, and they accomplish so much. Mm -hmm. so, and my counselors, my teachers were telling me that they're like, we know you have ADHD, but you could do so much more. Like, of this course. could probably be a good thing. Don't take it as a bad thing. Yeah, um, it's all to do with, with perception, how you perceive things. Because I, I as you say, I, I totally relate with what you're saying. Because I was, I knew I had something wrong with me or wrong with me when I was uh, eight years old um, because I used to have seizures I used to have a lot of it but I didn't know what it was until it was diagnosed around the age of 11 um, and if I was to tell you my initial childhood dream was to actually travel the world because my parents um, uh, we come from similar backgrounds they only travel to the UK and Bangladesh Bangladesh in the UK that's all they knew uh, they didn't know the wider the wider world other countries they've never been to other countries um, so for me, it was almost as if I wanted to explore and I was told by my doctor when I was uh, um, diagnosed that I cannot get onto a plane on my own, uh, that I, was, I always had to have somebody holding my hand because these seizures could occur multiple times. For example, on a usual day when I wasn't uh, on medication, it could happen like five, six, maybe seven times a day and they would last quite, quite, they would be quite severe. Uh, so it, that was a challenge. And when the doctor told me that I cannot travel on my own, no matter even if it's on a local bus uh, going to or even going out to the shops, I cannot be on my own. That was scary. That was frightening to think that I'm going to have to hold somebody's hand for the rest of my life. Um, and it was only until I realized that I, I had to be more than what my um, what this whole situation was all about, what the whole condition was all about. There are people out there who have, with epilepsy, who have done great things. So I started looking up to, to them. Again, that one level ahead of me, how have they done it? And it was the fact that, uh, you know, when I, in my childhood, I used to draw little country flags um, and used to color them because I was told that I cannot travel. So I used to bring the world to me. Um, that's how I actually named my first book, The World at Your Feet. Um, and, and it came from this childhood uh, struggle that uh, me wanting to travel and it was only until the point when I got invited 
invited to go to Nigeria. I was uh, 17 years old and the book got published that uh, it became a, a big success, uh, selling around 42 and a half thousand copies initially in the, in the UK. Uh, and then that got internationally recognized. And when I received my first invitation to go and actually deliver a, a professional and motivational talk abroad for the first time, I was scared. I was scared purely on the basis that I'm going to another country which I have not, uh, you know, never been to. Never, I've been told I cannot be on my own. So I took my uncle with me, and that gave me courage. That actually, it's not as bad as it was. Being on medication, I was learning to control myself. I was learning to control what is possible and what is not. Um, how far I could push myself. What are my boundaries? What are my limits? And after giving the talk, 20 minutes on stage, and I saw everybody stand up on their feet, give a standing ovation. Six months later, there was a young Nigerian guy who was uh, in the audience who comes over to London, flying over to London to come sh uh, shake my hand and say, Sabirul, you've changed my life. And that was a complete eye opener that I could actually go to another country and, and make a difference. And I think in my, thinking to myself, I've done it. And even if my uncle wasn't there, I wouldn't have been afraid. I could have done it myself. So that experience gave me the courage, gave me the belief that actually let me try. Let me try and see what happens. I got myself my medical insurance and so on and so forth, went off to uh, my, my second country. Uh, and that was also an opportunity for me to explore. As much as it is about delivering my talks and empowering the audience, it was also a learning curve for me. How much can I push my own self to learn exactly what boundaries I have and whether my condition is actually as serious as initially perceived to be. And the more and more I believed in myself, the more and more I was able to control it and it did not overthrow me. Yes, there were occasions in, in, in abroad where I did have seizures, where I did have to go to hospital and these things would happen, but I never let them overthrow me. I never let them be uh, something that is, is a burden on my shoulder. I see it as a gift. I see it as a part of me that I just need to learn how to control and maintain and you leverage as a story to tell that no matter what condition you have, no matter what struggle you face, um, everybody has a story to tell. And when you tell the story in the right manner that can empower others, which is exactly what I love doing. I like to share my story, share, share my message to inspire other people that they can do the same, no matter what is pulling them down. Um, and my epilepsy was one small factor of that story that I was thrown into um, abyss when my doctor told me that, no, you cannot travel. And my childhood dream was to travel the world, see beyond the UK and see beyond um, Bangladesh. And I combined that childhood dream with my passion of speaking on stage. So when I combined these two together, I became an international speaker going around the world receiving invitations year in, year out, month in, month out to go and try and inspire as many people. And that's how I set up the Inspire One Million campaign. Uh, to, and I spoke at 867 events uh, in 31 countries in four years. And to event one after, an, after another. And some days it'd be like six, seven events in another country. And one of the great stories that came out of it was my tour in Botswana where I did 43 events in the space of 12 days in, uh, uh, in 10 cities. So doing a 360 degree road trip across the entire country and that set, set way. And if you ask me now, is my epilepsy a, a struggle for me? Is, is, uh, do I fear it? No, it's like another, if I have a seizure, I have a seizure, I carry on, move on after five minutes. Hey, that's pardon me, it's, it's embedded in me. I live with it, I embrace it. And anybody who has a condition, I'd always tell them, find its weak point, not your weak point. You, you will have weak points in whatever it is you want to learn in life and you embrace those, but you don't consider your illness or your condition to be a weak point. You, it's a part of you learn how to work around that. Um, and, and I got to do that and I got to embrace it. And, and to be fair, it's not affected me any, any more than it needs to affect me. Wow. Yeah. So do you think kids nowadays are motivational? Depends. It depends what they do. For instance, you two are a great example of what motivation means. Um, so when when you're young, when you do something different, and when you're doing it for a good cause, and you're trying, you have a, an an end goal in mind, because your goal in doing this interview is to inspire other people similar to you and in, in your age group. Um, so you had a goal, you had an ambition, and you had a vision in mind. More young people need that. And with the whole drive in social media, especially, depends how you leverage it, how you utilize it. You're using the online platform in a great way to share your message, 
um, share who you are, get your passion, get your energy out there for a positive means. Um, there are others who use, don't use it for quite as positive. So it depends where you see yourself on the spectrum. And if you haven't woken up to exactly where you see yourself on the spectrum, you need to have an ambition. Because when you, if somebody's ambition is to be on their phone 24-7, you know, Twittering and, and Googling and, and being on, uh, commenting on Facebook or, or, or Snapchat or any, and, and whatever else is out there, um, then I'm sorry, you're, you're wasting time because you can use those platforms for better, better means, just like how you're doing. You're leveraging what YouTube has to offer in order to maximize uh, and grow a platform, grow an audience and deliver the message in whatever shape or form that you're delivering. And I, I raise my hat off to, to you both because that, that shows that you can use what's out there for positive means. And I think for more young people need to do the same. And it's not always about, um, it can be in whatever. Some people who are, for example, gamers, um, they love sharing about their game. They talk about their passion for game and other gamers join in. They're using it for a great means because they're connecting with people in their industry who they love and they're passionate about. So you have to find what it is you love and connect with that sort of group of people in order to accelerate and see what, how you can have a long, long-term future based on it. Uh, and it's not just a short-term thing just so that you can pass time. If it is just to pass time, uh, then I'm sorry, there's better ways to utilize your time so that you can think of more, more ways you can actually accelerate and grow in your career. So always have that long-term objective. What is it that you want to accomplish and what are the steps you need to take to, to get there? So young people have a lot to learn, um, but I think the young people of today have learned so much more than even when I was in my teenage uh, era. So um, yeah, it's just making sure that you can keep up with it. Wow. <laughs> How did you feel when you got an award from a prince? <sighs> How did I feel? Um, well, my hands were like this. I was shaking, I was nervous um, because just, standing in front of the queen's son uh, who is to be the next king of the united kingdom so uh, yeah that was a big ask and that was a big thing but it was such a proud moment honestly speaking to be uh, to be honored such a, an award it was called the mosaic entrepreneur of the year award and i was nominated by in fact i was nominated by my mentor um, and, and I think mentoring is, is such a big thing that you all need to have a mentor in life, somebody who can guide you, you know, who can tell what's right and wrong, who can make you feel accountable for what you're doing. So that's what my mentor did. So he nominated me for the award. There were so many other people in the room, uh, so many other uh, nominees, and it was a complete shock to me. Me and my parents were there, and it was a shock to them that I actually was called out as the winner. Um, so to receive that award was such a proud moment in my life. And uh, I would not change it for the world because it, it just shows that what you've done, it's being acknowledged, it's being appreciated from people who are much higher up, much more senior, who have, you know, and, and it's just making sure that you don't do it just for that, but you, you know that there are people there acknowledging what you do. And I think that's important. So it was a big moment for me, yes. Wow, so did, how did your parents react? Um, they were crying. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's only natural. It's only understandable. And I think one, one of my, if I was to tell you, one of my biggest regrets, it wasn't just the prince who was there. It was also the princess of Jordan. So she was also there on stage as well. And I was so starstruck just to be in front of um, His Royal Highness Prince of Wales, Prince Charles. I was just so starstruck that I completely forgot to shake the hands of, uh, of the princess of Jordan. Um, so that's my big uh, secret that I'm just sharing uh, with you. I've not shared this with anyone else before. Um, so it's something that you can utilize on your platform. But yeah, it just goes to show how starstruck and, and how on the, on the moment. And I was like, ah, wow, amazed. Um, but it was such a, such a proud moment and such a proud feeling. So I did go and apologize to the princess afterwards <laughs> though, backstage. Yeah, like so mistakes like that usually happen when you get either nervous or, you know, yeah, like, yeah that just happens. Yeah, I was 18. I was 18 at the time. So uh, I was still learning. There was a, a lot to learn. And especially with new people, uh, I, I was just, uh, my book uh, got, recently just got professionally published at that age. Um, and it's just trying to see exactly how far I can go and, and, and what I can do. Yeah, so that's it. So now we're going to ask you the more like the cool basic questions. So what's your favorite food? 
What's my favorite food? Um, Italian, so it would be the spaghetti bolognese or lasagna. Um, both of them. I, I also love pizza. So anything Italian for me, throw it in there and, and I, I'll munch on it like any, any other person, you know? <laughs> what are your interests and hobbies? Like, I, I think I know like one of your interests is business and going up on stage. Yeah, well, public speaking is my, my passion. Um, so being a motivational speaker, whether that's speaking at schools, whether that's speaking on a, on a, on a professional level in, in organizations at award ceremonies, that. But putting that aside, putting the professional side aside, uh, what I love is I'm a big soccer fan, so a big football fan. I don't play it as much as I used to, but I do watch it. I'm a huge uh, Arsenal fan. So if any of your followers are Arsenal fan, fellow Guna here, <laughs> um so uh but but yeah in in terms of other sport yes i do love tennis i play some tennis here and there i love golf uh so a lot of people might see that i'm a bit old school with with golf but uh it is it is nice to play um so yeah i'm very much sports driven and formula one so that, that's what i do and then that's that's how i pass my time and especially um especially being married now and then and, and take my wife out here and there so we enjoy our, our time uh, out as well so it, it's 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 something that I, I i love love doing and making sure that we can all enjoy both the professional side of what we do and also have a personal life to actually also enjoy as well oh, so you mostly like sports yeah very much so yeah and i know like these are um like you know tough times going on with the coronavirus and all that and usually most places are on lockdown and people are doing like quarantine so how are you spending lockdown well, I'm actually writing a new book. So I've actually completed during this, uh, this uh, lockdown, half the book has already been written. It's called Build Your Confidence on Stage. And uh, it's all to do with public speaking. And the whole idea is to help aspiring speakers who have a passion for the world of public speaking to turn that passion into a lifestyle profession. So how, what are the steps you need to take? So I talk about one thing, which is called the speaker psychology. It's how you develop that initial mindset. I talk about the principles of public speaking. So the expectations from the industry itself. Uh, I talk about the performance masterclass, uh, which is exactly how you do your facial expressions, your body language, your tone, how to write a script and so on and so forth. And then the, the final part, the fourth part, which is the, uh, the profession of a public speaker. So how to turn all of that into a professional uh, lifestyle business. Um, and actually start earning money through speaking. So I take uh, uh, people who read the book on a learning journey through the four pillars. Um, so that's coming out in December this year. And uh, so uh, all the details will be uh, on my website uh, in, in, in a couple of months time. So you're actually one of the first people to know that a new book is, is coming out, so yeah. Wow, yeah, I think I'm gonna need that book because my <laughs> confidence level is really 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 low it's zero because i fired Beyonce well the, the first way is to is to have that self-belief and to you know i think you improve your relationship with self-doubt the fact that you even reached out to me the fact that we even having this uh this conversation this interview it shows that you actually your confidence level is actually so much higher than what you actually perceive it to be um so it's just having that belief that yes you can be confident that you are confident and you can give anything a try um rather than thinking no actually i'm not confident so you have to have that positive mindset uh, and control your relationship with self-doubt um because that's very important good luck for the book yeah good Thank luck you. i hope your book will uh, turn out to be a, a success and i know it because you know you're really inspirational and people will always look up to you like how we are let's hope so let's hope so i'm praying it all goes well um but yeah it's still a long way to go it launches in december so and only half the book is written so i've got another half to write and have to submit it before july so yeah yeah so well this is all the time we have i just want to ask that how is your ramadan and fasting going well, fasting is, is one of the big challenges for me. Um, that's one of the things in being epileptic, being on medication is actually quite difficult to do. Um, so it is on and off uh, for me. And that's just me being honest with it. But in terms of everything else, I do love Ramadan. I, I, I try to support and especially give as much charity as I can uh, during this month. So it's just making sure that everybody else does the same as well. So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for accepting our request. I mean, it was been such an absolute a huge pleasure. Honor. Yeah, really. My, the pleasure's all mine just to be interviewed by you both. And it's actually like, wow. Um, <laughs> so uh, now I'm really proud. And, and uh, yeah, you two are absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. And hopefully we could stay in contact and reach out with each other. And hopefully we might do another interview with you. Definitely. Yeah. Just, just give me a, a bell and a buzz. And uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be all yours. 
Okay, thank you so much. Okay, bye. Take care. Bye-bye.